So welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. So I would like to do first a session on computer arithmetic. Yeah, maybe that looks a little bit detached. Yeah, Okay, that is maybe something for a computer scientist. But we will have at the end of this session, yeah, so maybe at the end of the next session, yeah, so we cannot do it in one session. Example, examples where you see that it is actually important for you to understand how the computer is performing the numerical calculations. Uh, there are very simple things. So for example, the expectation of a random variable, say e of x, can be approximated by averaging samples of x. Well, just take the sum, one divided by n, i from one to n, x of omega i. So depending on how you generate the omega i, it is like this, or it is with a weight, with a probability weight times pi. Okay, that doesn't matter. This is a sum that has maybe lots of summons. So the n is maybe large. So and already calculating such, such a sum may have problems in the computer. And that's an example we have at the end of this little chapter on computer arithmetic. And yeah, I believe it is uh, an important aspect that one knows this stuff, because if you don't know the stuff, you just implement your mathematical formula in a computer, you press run and you get some result and you believe the result is correct, but it is not correct. Okay, so let's start with a very basic aspect. Um, we will discuss the representation of numbers. So we like to look at computer arithmetic. Thing is that a high level programming language usually hides the details of what is going on under the hood from you, but there are certain undesirable effects yeah, coming from how the computer arithmetic works and it may affect the quality of our calculation. So our main focus in this chapter is the representation of a finite set of real numbers and uh, their operations. So we discussed the representation of the so-called floating point numbers as it is specified in the IEEE 754 standard. Okay, so that sounds now a bit um, exotic, but this standard is actually used in many programming language. So it's used in many modern programming languages in C++, in C, in Java, in C Sharp, and in frameworks like MATLAB. You all, have, you everywhere you have this standard, maybe with a few minor modifications, but the essence that we will see here is, um, common to all, to all of them. I like to start with integers. So of course the floating point numbers are the interesting guys. Yeah? And we will have some fun yeah, looking at strange little thing with floating point numbers. But before I comment on the floating point numbers, let me start with um, integers. So the computer can represent internally an integer in binary form. So he represents numbers from the set of 
integers that lie within a certain interval. And now I call here the interval integer dot min value is the lower bound and integer dot max value is the upper bound. And these are actually the names um, of the constants in the Java program that give you the corresponding number. So if you are in the Java program and you would like to know what is the smallest possible integer value, then you can ask, okay, please give me integer dot min value. So within this interval, we can uh, represent uh, the integer. So if we use 32 bit and the integer here has 32 bit, then we may represent two to the power of 32 numbers. Yeah? So I only use here base two, yeah? so it's binary. So that's maybe already um, a huge range. How would you choose the min value and the max value? Yeah, you would like to have some negative numbers and some positive numbers. So maybe we have almost as many negative numbers as we have positive numbers. So here the minimum value is minus two to the power of 31. And since we also need to represent the zero in between, uh, well, we cannot represent two to the power of 31 positive values. We have then two to the power of 31 minus one positive values. So in sum, we have two to the power of 32 numbers because there's also the number zero, yeah? So maybe if I make here the positive ones in a different color, yeah, then we have the number of the positive numbers, we have the zero and we have the negative numbers that give us all together two to the power of 32 different numbers. So we can represent these integer numbers. Um, a small question. What happens if I take this maximum value, integer dot max value, and I add one to it? Okay, so maybe you can think a little bit about this for yourself. And to answer it, I would just like to try it out. So I will do some live coding sessions with you. So what I have here is just Eclipse, uh, my development environment. Um, and from time to time, I try to do live coding. So I do not use prepared code. Sometimes I have to use prepared code to save a little bit of time. Uh, but I believe the live coding shows you that maybe sometimes things are easy to set up and to experiment a little bit with it. So I have here um, an almost empty project. Yeah, so it is a Maven project. So I use uh, Maven for dependency management. And you see there are no uh, classes here inside. I already created here a package. So package names are like reversed internet domain names. So we have quantlab.info for this course. So it's info.quantlab and then we use dot numerical methods dot lecture. So that's maybe the package where I do my live coding. And now I'd have your computer arithmetic and I would like to create now a new class where I do some experiments. So let's call this here integer arithmetic experiment. I would like to have a main method because I will write every experimental code now in this main method. So we are not creating objects at this point. So I just want some space here where I can do some experiments with you. And in order to have a nice output, yeah, let me first print, say kind of headline. Yeah, so maybe a new line and then some experiments related to integer arithmetic. So that's just my little headline. And maybe I also can have a nice 
little separation. Yeah, so I just use here an underscore repeated 80 times and say a new line character as a separation. So that's just my title. So the first um, experiment I would like to do is the behavior of integer dot max value. So let's do just uh, what I mentioned. I would like to have the max value. So you can do integer dot max value to get this constant. And if you now hover with the mouse above this, you also see here a nice little description. So this is here the binary representation. You see all bits are on, yeah, except the guy that is representing the sign. So this is this huge number here. It's a constant holding the maximum value of an int. It's two to the power of 31 minus one. Yeah, exactly like I had on my script. And now, Let's define a new variable and I call this variable i plus one and I assign to it the calculation i plus one. So let's print the numbers. So I print first the i. Yeah, okay, the so i, maybe I need a little bit more space here. So let's print the i and then I print the i plus one. So what is the i plus one? So that's here just description, the i plus one. Okay, and uh, maybe also let's do a small check. So um, is i larger or smaller than i plus one? So i larger than i plus one, actually that should be false. Yeah? So this is, so let's just perform this check here, i larger than i plus one. So there has to be maybe the variable here, i plus one. So yeah, then maybe I print again, a little separator and my small experiment is ready. So I hope I did everything correct yeah, because this is a little bit live here and let's, let's run this program. Okay, and you see this was two to the power of 31 minus one. This is two to the power of 31. Hmm but there's a minus in front. It is integer dot min value and i larger than i plus one is true. Okay, so i is larger than i plus one. So when I do this live, I do a lot of typos, yeah. So, but you will find this code checked in. So maybe this is a small and maybe a bit academic example because maybe our cal calculation will rarely reach this point where we have this overflow. But what you see is that there is no warning. There is no error. Yeah? He just goes on. So this is here our little code session, explore integer, what is integer dot max value plus one. And whenever I have such a code session, I have here in the script, a link to the GitHub repository where you can find this class, actually maybe in a much nicer form you know, with a little bit more description. Uh, and you can run it then at home and maybe play a little bit with this. So the answer to this question is, if we add one to the max value, then we will get the minimum value and the i plus one is actually smaller, it's the minimum value than i.
So what is actually happening here is trivial if you have seen this picture before, because the numbers just go in a circle. So if you perform some arithmetic operation, for example, you just add two to one, you reach the three. And if you perform an arithmetic operation that crosses the max value, then you just come back at the other side in the sense that adding one to max value is the min value. So we are just running in circle. And that means that is the reason why he doesn't even care about an overflow because for him, it's just going on and on and on. Well, we, we are uh, mathematicians and we can express this a little bit more complicated. Yeah. So what it means is that the integer arithmetic here is based on an equivalence class. So what's the equivalence class? So if you have some function, so I have some function G that combines two integers and assigns it to a new value in Z. Yeah? So all possible values, not even the one that the computer can represent, a value in Z. So this guy here is the mathematical function. The G is the mathematical function I like to consider. Then there is the computer implementation. So the integer arithmetic of this function G in the computer. So that's here the G tilde. So it's the computer implementation. So it has to map from I times I, uh, the set of integers to I. So it has to perform some kind of whatever projection or what. Yeah. So this is now the corresponding computer implementation, the G tilde. Well, then we have that the G tilde equals the G up to a shift by the length of my interval. So two to the power of integer size. So this is here, um, say, you could also write it as G tilde is equal to G modulus, the size of my interval, yeah? two to the power of integer size. So integer size was in our case here, uh, the 32. Yeah? You can also just go to the code and check integer underscore size. It's the 32, the number of bits used to represent uh, the interval. Okay, so here you see the example for the special case where integer size is four. Yeah? So I have four bits, yeah? two to the power of four is 16. So now I can choose a minimum value, for example, minus eight and a maximum value, for example, seven. And you have this circle where you then just jump from the seven to the minus eight. Yeah. In some cases, this can affect some other operators. Yeah? For example, the modulus operator uh, also behaves a little bit strangely. Yeah? If you would like to calculate the modulus of an integer number, uh, then you actually have the rule that uh, the sum of the modulus of two numbers is the modulus of the sum of the two numbers. But that rule is no longer valid if you jump to the negative side, huh? because the, uh, here actually the modulus operator um, is a negative number. So as there are some operators that are uh, maybe affected by this, this thing. 